Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Ward Carroll, the Naval Institute's Director of Outreach and Marketing. Joining me is my co-host, Proceedings Editor-in-Chief, Bill Hamlet. Hello, Bill. Hey, Ward. How are you? I'm doing fine here in our virtual construct. Um, so we're fresh from the Surface Navy Association Convention, uh, always a highlight of our winter, of our January, sort of a hybrid event this year. Um, I was there first day, you were there second day. Um, and so there, there was, as you remarked yesterday, more presence than maybe we thought there would be. So that's, that's good. Plenty of industry presence. It is weird slash challenging to try to do business and, and see people with a mask on. Um, but definitely we, we did, did manage cause you kind of halfway pass somebody like, I think that's, you know, and then it's like too late. Yeah. Um, but, uh, did manage to see some, some folks and, uh, our guest today is the editor in chief of us and I news. And we're looking forward to hearing his takeaways. Uh, so what, what did you think? Well, I was impressed, as you mentioned, the, the number of people and also the number, the industry presence was uh, the the crowds were not, maybe not quite back to 2018, 2019 levels, but there were a lot of people there. Um, you know, on Wednesday, I was there for the awards luncheon. Uh, always go to that because uh, they, they one of the awards that SNA presents is the literary award. And for the last, I don't know, I think we're five years in a row at least, um, proceedings authors have won both the uh, first prize and the runner-up. Uh, so we had on the podcast back uh, last summer, I think it was the Ilteris Brothers, um, who had written a great piece about Hunter Killer, re 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 Resurrect the Hunter Killer Group. So that article was the uh, the winner of the SNA Literary Award this year. Unfortunately, the, the authors could not be at the uh, at the award ceremony, but it was also kind of cool to see, and I got to meet with uh, some of the JOs who won different awards, including the Ship Handler of the Year Award, uh, Lieutenant Peterson off of one of the uh, minesweepers. Uh, um, he, he was uh, just, just cool to meet, you know, JOs who are doing great things and kind of rocking it out there, right? He's also written for proceedings. We haven't published his piece yet, but he took uh, one of the prizes in the mine uh, warfare essay contest uh, last summer. So uh, that was great. Got to meet with some of the uh, Coast Guard JOs, uh, particularly cool with the um, the video of the year award. So they do a, you know, the videography award. And uh, those two videos, the winner and the runner up uh, for the Coast Guard were, were very motivating. And then uh, Coast Guard Commandant Carl Schultz was there. And so we're, you know, he's been on our show, he's written for proceedings uh, and, and he's great. And Brooke Millard, our former Coast Guard fellow, uh, uh, federal executive fellow, got to see her. She's his uh, like director of communications. Director of Communications. So always good to see Brooke. Uh, good to be back at SNA. Good to see people. And as you said, you know, good industry presence uh, and and more people than than frankly I'd expected in middle of January, given what's happening around the country. So, but let's get right to Sam because uh, Sam was there all three days. His whole team was there. They're starting to churn out stories about. Uh, things that were talked about at SNA, including DDGX, the Navy's next generation, uh, you know, surface combatant, which, you know, hopefully will come sometime at the end of this decade. So Sam Legrone, great to have you back on the show. Great to be here. Uh, so your, what was your perspective, Sam, on SNA? What, you know, what were the big news stories that you guys are following up on? I, I mentioned DDGX, but what else was happening? Uh, what, what kinds of things did both uh, Admiral Kitchener and, and, and CNO talk about? Well, I think the thing this year that was really interesting about uh, the Surface Navy Association is kind of the depressing undercurrent on it. everything that's happening right now is the fact that the top line or depressing for the Navy is the top line numbers for the budget aren't really going anywhere. And so the the current fiscal year 22 budget is kind of mired in politics and we're uh, sitting on the, the edge of a continuing resolution that could freeze uh, spending levels for the rest of the year without a new budget passing. So we'll see what the approach happens. So um, to, you know, it, 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 it would be really exciting to talk about like the fun gear because there was a lot of fun gear that we saw, but uh, you know, kind of the baseline conversations for pretty much everything that was happening right now is what exactly is the funding profile going to look like for the Navy? Because it'd be really great to have a lot of the uh, material that you're seeing in a lot of these presentations. However, 
uh, the funding mechanism for all of these is less than clear. Um, so Luria and Gallagher, um, I think her colleague Mallory Shelbourne, uh, our deputy editor over at uh, USNI News, she wrote a pretty good story uh, kind of outlining kind of the budget woes um, in which uh, Representative Gallagher predicted more or less a bloodbath for the Navy's uh, spending priorities uh, in, in 2023. So we're looking at the, the federal budget dropping sometime in March. And then on top of that, uh, we've got a continuing resolution right now. So we're in the process of trying to keep six sets of budget numbers in our head very soon. And how much of that is going to translate into benefits for the surface force, it's, it's yet to be clear. Um, so with that downer out of the way, uh, I think probably the two things that, or three things that really stood out for me was, uh, first of all, I think uh, Chief of Naval Operations, uh, Admiral Mike Gilday, took the opportunity to try and reset the conversation around command. Uh, so we're coming off a year of uh, several years of, of some of some pretty preventable mistakes for the Navy. I think in particular, the one that's kind of in the back of everyone's mind right now is the Bonhomme Richard fire from uh, June of 2020. Um, that uh, fire, uh, as uh, shown by the recent command investigation that was released um, uh, late last year, is the just a complete end-to-end -end cascade of failures, I think is what we put in our story, um, from the waterfront to the ship to uh, all the way up to the uh, former surface uh, forces commander um, in sort of complacency and uh, the inability to um, execute on keeping ships safe and maintenance. And so I think um, when Admiral Gilday came onto uh, the podium, uh, at Surface Navy Association, he previewed his new charge of command. So um, this is the document that they give to everyone in the Navy who's about to take command of a ship or any unit whatsoever. And uh, those have been revised uh, the last time, I think it was 2018, where, uh, uh, with Admiral Richardson. And, and uh, now the new one in uh, 2022 uh, essentially emphasizes, hey, let's kind of own our mistakes, let's stand up and if you need help, say help, a zero defect mentality is costing us uh, the advantage in future conflict if we try to minimize our problems or pretend that they don't exist. So that uh, for us kind of set the stage for a lot of the conversations that followed. And then after that, you had uh, Admiral Kitchener, he's the SWO boss right now, um, started uh, talking a lot about uh, data and artificial intelligence and using data and artificial intelligence uh, to go and really start to get a handle on what exactly was going on in the surface forces. Um, and they made, he made a big deal that like we have a new North Star that uh, outside of our commitments to the global force management process, what we owe all of the strike groups uh, is that we need to uh, see how many ready ships that we can go and offer not only for these you know, set pieces that we're obligated to by OSD, but what other margin can we create to create ready ships? And that is our new North Star. Admiral Kitchener declined to mention what that number was. And I think a, a lot of people were a little frustrated by their inability to know that. But I think the, the part that kind of got overlooked and we're gonna dig back into was the idea that um, I think in 2022, after, after about a decade of hearing about it, we're really gonna start to see practical applications of artificial intelligence, which is like, def I, we define it as like um, uh, an expert opinion in the room. Um, that's like like an entity that you could go to or co a construct that you can go to, to be like, hey, what do you think? And so we're gonna start to see that just a few days ago, um, PEO IWS 6.0 put out a request for information for an artificial intelligence based uh, navigation aid. So the idea would be is um, you would have, uh, you would plug in your navigation readout uh, into a machine that could go and look at um, the, uh, the vectors of all of the ships and aircraft that are around you. And then based on that would allow you to make suggestions like, hey, uh, you don't have to do this, but it would be a really, I think it would be great if you came to you know 10 degrees port and came back a third so you won't hit that merchant ship. So um, 
And then on top of that, we got our first big look at uh, DDGX, which is the large surface combatant, which the Navy for um, almost 20 years now has been debating what exactly the follow on to the DDG 51 is looking like. And so we finally got our first kind of real good sense of what that looked like after lots and lots of stops and starts. Gotcha. So Sam, um, back to the budget for a second, uh, you know, uh, you said it's pretty depressing news. So for our listeners, just remind them what happens to the defense budget when there's a continuing resolution? How is that, uh, you know, so impactful in a, in a negative way for, uh, you know, for shipbuilders, for maintainers, for operational planning, but also for industry? So what it, when you have a continuing resolution, uh, what it does um, is freeze the amount of money that you're spending from the previous year levels. So um, it, it's more or less kind of a stasis where you still get kind of the same money for gas, the same money for operations that you had had, you know, kind of budgeted pre previously, and it freezes all of those levels. So that means you can't start new programs. You can't start uh, building new ships because you can't enter into new contracts under a continuing resolution. And that's been um, sort of more the norm than the exception for the last uh, several years when defense budgets happen, but a year long continuing and, and the planners, the budget planners plan for that, that, you know, they're going to assume that there's going to be three months or so of, you know, sort of budget churn where they have to, you know, make some decisions on how they structure contracts. However, a year-long continuing resolution would prevent all sorts of ship starts. Um, there was a testimony on the Hill where uh, CNO said that it could uh, jeopardize the delivery of uh, the first Columbia-class ballistic missile submarine, which is uh, just about has no margin left. And as the Ohio-class boomers start to retire, that uh, patrol for Columbia is already kind of set on the books for timing for the strategic deterrent. And that's been the one thing that the Navy has been loath to uh, mess with in any way, shape, or form. And that's been the number one acquisition priority. And the fact that you have the CNO saying that, hey, this delivery could be delayed shows that there's very, very little budgetary margin left. So the other thing you guys reported on, Sam, is the third Zoom Walt came out of the what construction process and is headed down to Mississippi for follow on fitting out fitting out and and so um how does that class net out we'll remind the audience that we had the skipper of zoom Walt on the podcast almost two years ago uh, when we were at sna um so what how's the navy thinking that they're going to use this ship is this just a test bed w what's going on with that so the Zumwalts are a really interesting class of ship. So to, to remind folks, they're, they're a, you know, they call them a destroyer, but they're essentially a light, light cruiser. They're 16,000 tons. They're, they're, they're really, really big ships. And they were designed uh, specifically around uh, operating in the littorals, uh, being really close to shore. So if you look at some of the uh, early uh, 2005, there's some, there's some pretty hilarious video on YouTube for some of the concepts of operations, just, you know, in terms of production values of really blocky soldiers kind of walking around in a jungle. Uh, but the idea is their uh, primary weapon, the way that they were designed to operate were these two big 155 millimeter advanced gun systems. So essentially it's a really, really big um, naval gun and there's two of them. And the idea would be that they would fire these sort of rocket assisted guided rounds um, upwards of 75 nautical miles uh, to targets. So you would have this really exquisite uh, naval surface fire support for uh, operations ashore. And these things were developed for sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, when the idea would be that, you know, we're not talking about great power competition. We're talking about, you know, operations against irregular actors, uh, insurgencies, what have you. Um, so this was, uh, one of the kind of the Rumsfeld era. These, these ships were part of the Rumsfeld era, uh, you know, uh, high technology. Let's, let's cram everything in there, uh, that we can, that's new and revolutionary. These ships were, uh, designed to, for a very specific era. And then, you know, sort of the world moved on into kind of this, this time of great power competition. So now the Zumwalt's 
have a lot of really interesting things that the surface Navy likes. So instead of these kind of, you know, green water combatants, they're really looking um, to shape these as really aggressive blue water um, platforms for, for hypersonic missiles. So these are going to be the first platform that the Navy is going to be fielding uh, hypersonic weapons starting in about 2025. So they're going to take these big gun mounts out and they're going to put in uh, essentially what, um, I mean, think about it as sort of like the six cylinder revolver. Um, it's, uh, they call them the Mac tubes, the, uh, that they use for the submarines and they're going to make them big enough so you can put in the, uh, the, the common hypersonic glide body. And these are going to be, um, really, they're almost like the Seawolf class submarines. So the Seawolf class submarines are these three submarines that are really deep diving, really aggressive. They have a huge weapons room. I mean, they call them fleet killers. And I think the Zumwalt is going to take some of that same role from the surface side. So they're hard to see. Um, they're going to be fitted out with um, a lot of really aggressive uh, strike weaponry. And I think you're going to see them in the future be sort of the centerpiece of uh, like surface action groups in some really aggressive um, uh, old school um, surface uh, packages that are to be kind of steaming out um, primarily in the Pacific. So that's going to be really interesting to see. So what happened uh, this week was the last ship, um, Johnson, uh, left, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson left Bath, Maine, uh, and it's going down to Mississippi for its combat systems activation. Um, so it's uh, good news for General Dynamics Bath Ironworks because these three ships in this little yard up in Maine had been um, a real kind of drag on the production of everything there. So in addition to the DDG 1000s, they were also producing the DDG 51 Arleigh Burke restarts. And so um, with that last ship out of there, the yard at Bath can go and uh, knuckle down and start focusing on the DDG 51 ships. And so um, the Johnson's going to be down in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi now at Huntington Ingalls, and it's going to fit out the rest of the combat systems and stuff now that the hull and mechanical is all done. And then uh, go and join the fleet probably out in San Diego. That's so where, cool. where is Johnson in terms of cost and schedule? Uh, the, the cost and schedule for all of the Zumwalt's are blown. Um, so we're looking at about their, the, the whole program now without the R and D is, or the, I think the whole program together is about $14 billion. Um, and so, uh, divide that by three, uh, and then you get a pretty expensive ship. Um, what's really unique about them is they have this thing called the integrated power system. So um, like an old school DDG, like a DDG 51, you have your gas turbine output and it fits into the main reduction gear and the main reduction gear takes that high RPM and lower, adjusts that torque so it'll drive the screws. The way the Zumwalt's work is that uh, the NT30s, uh, those big Rolls Royce, they produce uh, uh, gas turbines, they produce about 75 megawatts of power and that instead feeds uh, an electrical grid. So everything on the ship is electrical. So you just have the, um, the, the, the gas burning turbines go and they power this grid as opposed to mechanically direct to the props. And that has led to a lot of cost development uh, or uh, cost overruns in sort of developing that technology and, and, and fitting them in there. And then the, I, I, can't, I can't even tell you how late the ships are, but they're very late. Sam, go back for a second to uh, what you mentioned about command and about uh, Admiral Gilday talking about his charge of command. So lots of news over the past couple of years about, you know, 05 and 06 level Navy uh, commanding officers being relieved, uh, relieved for lack of confidence, relieved for, you know, you name the the um, the reasons. Uh, so Admiral Gilday talks about, yeah, we're, you know, out of the zero defects mode. If you need help, raise your hand. Um, what's happening, you know, what's the sense that you get, uh, at the, you know, sort of, I don't want to say deck plate leaderships. I don't mean, I don't mean chiefs. I mean, commanding officers or future commanding officers as they hear that, are they like, uh, is this real or is this, you know, or, or are we still going to be zero defects? If, if I'm in command, do I really have the ability to stand up and raise my hand and say, I'm not ready to get underway. I've got some problems. I need some help. I don't have enough manning uh, and, and, and still get promoted, right? And still have a successful command tour. 
it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think um, some of the more like so I heard from a couple of department heads when the uh, uh, the new charge command came out, and there were probably there were a couple of cynical voices were like, oh, okay, so let's let's blame the skippers again, and you know it was sort of swung that way. And but I, I heard from a couple of other people who was like, well, this is healthy. This is healthy. I think um, you know I think it's no secret that the surface warfare officer path is is pretty challenging um given you know and i think the the one the only metric that you need to understand that is if you look at the amount of um SWO candidates that they get out of uh the academy and then rotc they get uh double of what they need for uh, eventual command because the attrition rate is so high um and i think uh part of that is a is a cultural issue and so how that how uh guild day's kind of charge of command kind of translates into kind of a, um, I don't want to say touchier, feelier, you know, SWO community, but um, to maybe be a little bit more tolerant of um, mistakes, uh, certain types of mistakes, uh, I think is useful. So, so yeah, so it was about 50, 50, um, you know, half, half the folks I talked to kind of eye rolled. Uh, and then um, the other half were like, well, this is, this is healthy. This is, this is a healthy progression. Yeah. So some of what my takeaway to sort of put Pony on what Bill was talking about, the the change the charge of command. You know, some of the wording used is okay. Cno expects Cos will seize absolute ownership. I thought this was interesting. You must remain accountable for both action and inaction, um, and no room for complacency. So, in some ways, this sort of read like tough love to me. Basically, if you're standing on ceremony about what the finite limits of your responsibilities are, that's not going to fly, right? So he's like, I expect CEOs to do more than what's on paper or whatever. So I thought this, the tone of this, uh, maybe to your point where you said some interpreted it as let's blame the CEOs. I thought it was kind of unflinching in terms of, you know, top down expectations for what command entails comprehensively. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think a lot of um, the subtext for what happened, you could find in the major fires review after the Bonham Richard fire. Um, I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, I think the investigators uh, found a lot of complacency in how that uh, particular ship was organized and ready to fight fires, you know, to the, the, component of the nav C uh, that's in charge of fire safety had spent a lot of time and a lot of energy after the USS Miami fire, uh, which, uh, you know, to remind everyone was a, a shipyard worker had set a fire to try and get off work and it blazed out of control and uh, ended up losing a Los Angeles class uh, uh, atomic submarine. And then following that, um, there was a big investigation. They were like, okay, so this is how we're going to prevent these in the future because the most dangerous time uh, for ship for fires is when it's in maintenance, when you're dealing with a reduced crew, uh, you're dealing with uh, obstructions, you're dealing with scaffolding all over the place, you know, if you're dealing with something big like a carrier or a big deck. Um, and falling in, in keeping, and what they found in that investigation was um, for all the major fires that have happened and the ones that were successful sex, successfully put out and the ones that weren't was that commanders that paid attention to damage control and fire safety in the yard were successful in preventing fires from getting bigger commanders that weren't didn't and there was more damage or to the in the case of the bhr lost the ship so i think behind that i think is is sort of what what that to me that's what that says is um, just because you're you're following the letter of the law doesn't mean that you're not um, doing everything that you can. I mean, to I mean, the, the one example for the BHR fire that always stands out to me was that the the there was confusion over whether or not they could wear their NW threes underneath their firefighting turnout gear, um, and there was some conversation instead of going to fight the fire, they were like, "Oh, can we wear these pants under these pants?" And, and that comes down to like a leadership culture uh, component. And it was just like, you're responsible for this and you need to make sure that culture is there. I mean, I think, I think there's that old saying, right? Walk on any ship, 
in, in the United States Navy and you can find a reason to, to, to fire the commander. Um, so that level of, uh, <laughs> and, and, and that's always been part of the, you know, kind of the culture, I think, from the uh, surface warfare uh, officer side. So being able to, you know, kind of go and ask for help and kind of expose yourself to go and ask for help, I think is important. But at the, on the same token, hey, don't hide behind the rule book if, if things aren't going well. Well, the other thing that Bill has been fielding lately is in the face of a you know diversity inclusion um, essay contest and other things is are these charges of a woke Navy. Um, so yes, this charge of command does speak about diversity of thought and background, that sort of thing. But I would also point to the stuff we were already talking about with respect to the tone and say the priority is war fighting. It is readiness. Um, and, and so I, I don't think this is all touchy feely, uh, woke tone from CNO here. Um, you know, so I, I think to counter that criticism, maybe this is part of why he struck that tone. I don't know. What do you think, Bill? Uh, I think that's a good point. And I know, uh, our boss, uh, Admiral Daly went to the, uh, retired flag officer pre-brief of SNA on Monday, spent a lot of time. And so there's a, always sort of briefings to that community to help them understand what's happening in the Navy, the priorities and, and get the word out. And, uh, Pete came back from that. And I, I know he said, he said, look, there was a real, uh, focus on the most important thing is war fight, you know, war fighting readiness. That is the most important thing. We could do other things, task force one Navy, uh, you know, diversity, uh, education, a lot of other things are important. Uh, but if we don't get war fighting, right, if we don't, if we can't build ships and maintain them and keep them at sea and, and, and get them ready for combat, nothing else really matters, particularly in this uh, current era of, of great power competition. So I think the CNO is probably touching on that. And if you can't get a ship like Bonham Richard through a maintenance period and back to sea, if instead a fire consumes it and you lose one of the, what is it, seven or eight LHD, LHAs in the Navy, that's a, that's a monumental self-inflicted shot to the foot. So uh, I wanted to touch on, uh, Sam, because I, I know you have insights in this, um, but in proceedings over the last couple of months, we've had a lot of, uh, of debate about the demands of foreign pr for forward presence. Sorry. So we had in the December issue, we had Bob Work, former Deputy Secretary of uh, Defense, former Undersecretary of the Navy, writing about the Navy's um, insatiable demand for forward presence has, has kind of broken the Navy. And then we had Admiral Fogo just a couple of weeks ago respond to that and say, wait, wait, this wasn't the Navy's um, demand for forward presence this was this is an um an uncurbed appetite from the combatant commanders who are always just having this demand signal more 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 you know you go back to to um you know general mattis when he was the centcom commander for example just had a, a constant demand for two carrier presence it wasn't just one but two carrier presence in centcom and that just ate up the the OFRP right so put a, a, a huge demand on the on the force so that plays into this whole thing about the charge for command so if you tell commanders hey uh, we want you to take responsibility and if you need pro if you've got problems if you're not ready if you don't have the right training etc to get underway raise your hand but at the same time if that demand signal isn't curbed from above how do you, how do you, you can't square that curve, right? You, you know, you, you put in the, you're putting the strategic onus really on 05 and 06 level commanders. And you're not, you know, you're not saying anything about those at the three star, four star level who aren't curbing that demand signal to allow ships to get ready, to be ready, to do the training that they need to do. Uh, I, I don't know. It, it, there's just, that also, I think, is an unbalanced part of the equation right now. I'm curious what you're hearing, Sam. Oh, uh, I mean, this is a, a no, it, it, those, those two uh, articles, I mean, they came up actually quite a bit uh, as to, uh, you know, kind of the, the conversation we're having right now in terms of, you know, what, what's the Navy of the future going to look like? What are Naval forces um, going to, how are they going to interact with, you know, the rest of the joint force, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think for starters, um, there's a, the, there's a finite amount of, uh, naval presence that you can put out there um, relative to the demand. I mean, I think that's always been part of the uh, the, the challenge. And so the Navy was really good at managing um, 
the demand for presence by having a pretty strict, uh, inflexible uh, system to go and, and deploy forces on a very, you know, sort of predicated schedule uh, that kind of went out the window at the beginning of the, the, the war on terror, um, where you had, uh, you know, at one point there were seven carrier strike groups underway. And I think when the combatant commander saw that, um, I think they were like, oh, wow, this is amazing. We can go and get these, you know, carriers all the time. And so that's always been a big part of, you know, kind of the presence demand for the combatant commander. But at the same time, all of the plans, I think I think you can make a solid argument that all of the plans in place to, to go and manage demand uh, for the force are probably pretty good, but they're just not resourced. So I think, um, I think it's, it's, I think, uh, Admiral Fogo and, uh, uh, Secretary Work are kind of arguing kind of both si elements of the same side of the coin, which is there, there is a demand that cannot be met. And how do you go and function with that? And I think the, I think the outcomes that they've both sort of predicated, um, in their arguments are, are a little different, but I think it's, it's, it's part, they're, they're both part and parcel of the same argument. You have a limited amount of forces and what do you do with it? And I think Secretary Work's argument is that, um, we the, the deterrence effect of having presence constantly out there and and he said this when he was the undersecretary too uh and so i'm paraphrasing here but he said that like uh, you know uh, kind of uh when he was working for um secretary carter uh the idea was is we'll have a smaller more lethal more highly capable force and the deterrent factor there is even if you don't see me you know, you have to make that decision. Uh, am I going to, you know, swoop down from on high and whoop your ass? I, that's and and that is less. That's more important than having kind of that that low grade, you know, phase zero, phase one presence. Um, and then on on top of that, uh, you've got Admiral Fogo saying that there is a demand for the combatant commander for all of these assets all the time. That's one hundred percent true. Um, and it all comes down to where we're at now which is uh, we're still paying the bill for um, skipping all of this maintenance, particularly for the surface fleet, but also for the sub folks um, during the war, uh, uh, the global war on terror and the demands that you had for the surface force that, you know, just keep them running, keep them running for the short term gain without, you know, putting the long term maintenance in. And so, I mean, it's a, it, there's no, from, from where we're sitting, it's the, the problem is so vast and and complex and part of it is demand part of it is the supply the demand from the combatant commanders and the supply from the individual services that are you know in charge of the bullets beans and the band-aids component and then um it's it's all very the system now is also very stressed that there's not a ton of margin so again there's like there's there's no real easy answers as to uh, kind of what the allegation is. So, sorry, that was a little bit rambly, but it's a it's such a complicated problem. Well, so Sam, when you're talking about op tempo, purse tempo, tempo kind of things, uh, we just had former SecNav John Lehman on the podcast, who's sort of the father of codifying, you know, six months to to twelve months in the interdeployment turnaround cycle as a template that cannot be violated, and this leads to obviously the father of the 600 ship Navy, which makes me wonder where are we with a target associated with numbers of ships? Is this lost now? Is that 355 even a thing? If not, what is the number? Or is this a line that's completely blurred now by these budgetary pressures? The, the number is in flux. So um, pretty much uh, 2020, um, was all about the kind of, um, it, it was kind of like Secretary Esper's ride to Damascus, uh, if I <laughs> the, a biblical term. So he, uh, I think CAPE, uh, the, the OSD um, organization that, uh, uh, you know, kind of looks at, you know, sort of long-term uh, defense procurement uh, and the Secretary Esper were, I think, uh, sort of at the beginning of 2020, were a little skeptical as to um, the Navy's uh, own calculus for what it needed for a fleet. And so when you add unmanned and manned 
uh, ships there, you have a number that ranges anywhere from about 400 to 500, depending on how you count the, the unmanned craft, um, which, is, which is a big number. So uh, as of Thursday, we were at 296 uh, ships in the fleet. Uh, or active battle force, um, you know, that that counts seven cruisers that have been pier side for a few years. So that number is a little squishy. Uh, with uh, anywhere from 90 to 100 ships uh, deployed at any given one time. Um, so in order to kind of maintain the presence and keep pace with the Chinese Navy, which is 350 plus as of last year, um, they uh, the idea is, is if the U.S. is playing away, we need anywhere from 400 to 450 ships, depending on how you count uh, the unmanned stuff. So for, for pretty much all of 2020, um, the, the Navy uh, was working with Secretary Esper to go and work uh, and sort of explain to him kind of how all of these functions work. Because, you know, explaining kind of naval force structure isn't particularly easy. Um, and right near the end of the Trump administration, Esper had come out with uh, Battle Plan 2045 and was completely converted and went to CSBA and was like, this is what we're going to do and gave a very sort of loose uh, idea of kind of what that was. And then when the Biden administration came in, it, everything kind of reset back to zero again. So the Navy's kind of been working through that with kind of the force structure and like, hey, this is what we want to do. This is where we want to go. However, um, I think the situation right now in the Pentagon is uh, number one, the budgets are going to be, you know, your top line is pretty much frozen right now. And um, <clears throat> I mean, the impression that we're getting is, uh, hey, Pentagon, you figure out how you want to spend your money. This is all you're going to get. Uh, and then, you know, the individuals uh, inside the service are kind of portioning out, um, you know, between the services, the money they get. And right now it's still in that one third, one third, one third uh grouping where you know the army gets about you know so much money and then the navy and the marine corps and then the air force and they're all sort of you know sort of equivalent money and i think there's some folks um you know in congress especially going like hey if this is the way that you're going to do it you need to maybe look at army and strength or you know some other you know army programs in particular and kind of route that money to the air force in the Navy uh, to go and look for your expeditionary forces. So I think there's a signal mismatch for a lot of people when you look at the national, the new national defense strategy, which is eminent here in the next couple of months, uh, is probably going to emphasize, you know, an expeditionary and naval mindset uh, for the United States. Uh, and is gonna emphasize that as a key component to um, the US national security posture moving forward in the future. Uh, however, is that gonna get resource behind that and are you still going to have this you know one third of them and then space force i don't know what percentage of the money that they need to go and operate so you have a lot of people uh competing for a very finite amount of resources that doesn't look like they're going to grow so the so what you're going to come up with is you're going to have a, a a force structure which is probably going to be anywhere in sort of the you know high 300s low 400s um when when it eventually comes out but it's not going to, the way the, the politics kind of shake out right now, it's probably not going to be resourced in any kind of reasonable way. And then on top of that, you know, um, as, an, as another artifact of the war on terror, you have um, each of the Navy's major uh, warfighting communities have a uh, brand new uh, capability that they've kind of been deferring to go and replace. So you need, um, you know, starting in the 2030s, you know, you're slated to have a replacement for the Super Hornets. That are in the fleet right now with FAXX, and that's part of the Next Generation Air Dominance Program right now. So that's getting funded. They're they're doing exploratory work there at Navair. You have DDGX, which we uh, talked about a, a little bit, which is going to be uh, you know replacing kind of the Arleigh Burks and the um, uh, Ticonderoga cruisers that are going to be kind of starting to come out of the inventory here pretty soon. And then you have SSGNX, uh, which is going to be the new uh, attack submarine. It's, and as far as we can tell. Uh, it's going to be a lot more uh, capable than the Virginia in terms of speed, dive depth, uh, the amount of weapons that it can hold. And so you have three very expensive uh, next generation programs that are coming online pretty soon. Plus, you have a legacy force structure that you have to deal with, you know, especially with some of these older uh, destroyers and cruisers, which are, um, you know, how much more money can you put in, especially on the Ticonderoga cruisers. So it, it's turning into a. Um, uh, kind of this complicated morass of what are you going to fund? What are you going to pay for? And then on top of all that stuff is what's the case you're going to make? 
what you need to go and make an argument for all of these funds. So going back to Secretary Lehman in the era of the 600 ship Navy with a uh, uh, pretty uh, intense support from the Reagan administration, um, uh, Secretary Lehman in the pages of proceeding made a pretty full throated argument for um, uh, an expanded Navy with a very kind of clear delineation of what the threat was. Um, I think what what's the famous line? Uh, I want every American to know that there are two Oscar class submarines off the East Coast at any given moment. Uh, and so when you do, go and define the Chinese threat, it's so much more complicated um, because it's a lot of gray zone incursion. Um, and then, uh, you know, we also are I'm, I'm talking to you on a webcam that was made in China. Um, and we didn't have that same industrial relationship with Russia. So the ability to go and make that argument kind of in a public way for a larger Navy, um, I think the Navy is finding particularly difficult, especially with a reluctance kind of all across the board to, to kind of talk about any kind of um, tangible idea of what the threat from China is. So it's, it's a, again, it's, a, it's a, a complicated set of circumstances. I mean, the gearing between all of it is, is pretty um, pretty gnarly, and then you know defining the threat beyond that is is also kind of a limitation that the Pentagon finds itself under under classification rules as they stand. Well, you you make a good point there with respect to defining the threat, and Secretary Lehman's most recent article in Proceedings is looking back at the Zumwalt era uh, as a way to define the threat. But I think you bring up points that make it uh, a little bit of a tough analogy. Um, because of the complexities of our relationship with the Chinese versus the, our relationship in the early 70s with the Soviet Union. Um, so plus social media diffuses the ability to reach the public in a way that I think uh, back in the early 70s with three broadcast channels and news only a half hour a day kind of stuff, it was easy to focus Americans on a threat in a way that that doesn't exist anymore. You know, so I think we've got our problems sort of laid out for us in a, in a way that uh, is uh, is substantial. Yeah. And another thing that uh, on the podcast last week, Secretary Lehman mentioned, you know, we, we had this 600 ship Navy uh, strategy. This the, the force structure was very much aligned to the strategy. We, we built 600 ships, navies, 600 ships in the Navy or towards that goal, not because we wanted 600 ships, but because we laid out a strategy. And then we said, here is the force structure needed to uh, put that strategy in place, right? To, it needed to carry out that strategy. And so he wasn't arguing for a certain size Navy to deal with China. He basically said, what's the strategy? What What are you trying to accomplish once you define that strategy, and that's part of the goal of the ongoing American Sea Power Project with uh, Proceedings of the Naval Institute, once you can define that strategy, then you can actually come up with a, a logical force structure. But until you have a good strategy, your force structure is just like, how are you going to spend the money, right? Here's your money and how are you going to spend it? How do you allocate it among the one-third, one-third, one-third? What are the new shiny things that you want? But what's the, what's the case for victory? What does it look like when you de deter China from doing more things in the South China Sea or threatening Taiwan or what is it you're trying to accomplish? So those are all, I think, uh, as you as you pointed out, this, this is a really complex Rubik's Cube right now. Um, this has been a great conversation. I know, Sam, you got to get off because you're getting ready to cover the maritime security dialogue that's starting here in about a half hour with Vice Admiral Cooper, the Fifth Fleet Commander. So our boss, Admiral Daly, is going to be interviewing him and uh, the news team will be covering that. In addition to all the stuff that you did um, this week as you're trying to wrap up your, your SNA coverage. So thanks for being on the show today, Sam. Um, I, kudos to you and the team. For those who um, follow the USNI news team and follow the amazing coverage that they put out, it is a, a team of three full-time people that put out, uh, you know, just the facts, ma'am, Monday through Friday, here's what's going on, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and you guys punch way above your weight. And you've also become the uh, program a record for you know for for Navy news and I think their your reputation across the fleet um, is just uh, is stellar so congrats on what you do oh it's always great to hear thank you all right well that wraps up another episode of the proceedings podcast next week we've got a, an episode of uh, of the naval history uh, podcast coming up uh, until then stay tuned and remember victory begins at the Naval Institute. This episode has been brought to you by the members of the U.S. Naval Institute.
For more, go to usni.org slash join.